And we have at our midst, gentlemen, distinguished engineer, nuclear engineer, former Army Lieutenant Colonel, who has worked, labored very hard in the vineyards to figure out the trail where physics went wrong so we can ultimately reconstruct how it can go right. And it's on the basis of Tom Bearden's work that I wrote, in essence, the hyperdimensional paper that appears on the web now. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague and a man whose vision is um, light years beyond most other folks, Colonel Tom Bearden. Thank you very much, Richard, and thank everybody for being here. It's a pleasure to be here. I've still got a little bit of that jet lag. But we're going to try to come down a little bit to Earth and hopefully then get back off Earth later tomorrow. But today I want to come down to things in the laboratory bench and into the models that we have for things on the laboratory bench that do extend out into space and see if we can gain some insight here as to some errors that were made and propagated throughout physics. Now, if our models are wrong and we're trying to apply an erroneous model to a problem where we keep asking questions, we're not going to get the right answers. So, as Einstein pointed out, one of the things we really should do is always question the model. There's no such thing as a perfect model. We make too many assumptions on the front end. But it sounds kind of dry and kind of boring and kind of silly to ask a question like, you know, what is time? What is mass? Blunt truth of it is, physics does not know what charge is, what time is, what mass is, what length is. None of these things. But they don't tell us that when they're teaching us in school. They come across as if we already have it all figured out and all we've got to do is wind up a few decimal places. Well, that's just not true. What we want to do is not chase the decimal places, but we want to chase the model itself, a little bit of its history, and find out what they actually put in it and what we ought to change today because we've learned a lot since then. Could I have the next slide, please? Basically, we will start in, you might say, physics, and particularly electrical physics, I'll throw in anti-gravity to you for free. That's not going to cost you anything. We'll throw in over-unity systems for you. We'll give you the theory of how they work. That is free. It won't cost you anything. We will explain what right now I think is the missing ingredients in cold fusion. And that won't cost you anything. But it will really stretch your imagination on what kind of waves we're actually dealing with. And then we'll try to turn to what this has to say about living systems, life, life on planets, and development of living systems, and what kind of scenario evolves for a living system that's also a technological animal. That is, it has a tool-using member, and it makes tools, and therefore has a technology, both for use to overcome its environment and in use against its own self-competition. Next slide, please. I think we've reached a momentous turn in, Amer in history. I would like to paraphrase Churchill, and of course you recognize the phrase from World War II, but I'm rephrasing it a little bit in a paraphrase. The technology we have today, some of it known, some of it not known, I'll refer to some that's not known, I won't dwell on it. We have not reached the end, and we have not reached the beginning of the end. But I think, as Churchill said, we've reached the end of the beginning. And we're being propelled full tilt into the beginning of the end. Next slide, please. And it isn't the kind of direction that science gives you. These are basic subjects. I won't stand here to read those things to you. We'll give you cold fusion effect. I'll tell you about the use of some of these rather strange waves to give you a totally new kind of healing, and this was proven. I don't have to prove anything. It's sitting in the hard literature in France. All we have to do is get the people to redo the experiments. And we will then try to describe the living part, and 
I will open up the question of the last human state, and I'll leave that up to you, because I'm not trying to speak religion or your own personal philosophy. That's your personal business. I'm just simply opening the subject, and I'm going to leave it that way. Next slide, please. Well, <laughs> science has a history of suppression. The worst enemy of science is organized science itself, and leading physicists of the world generally have always recognized that. In his day, the greatest physicist of the day, Max Planck, said, you know, basically the old guy's got to die out before you can ever have a new physics. It's as simple as that. It still is. Things go 50 years in the literature and are totally ignored. Uh, one paper that I'm talking quite seriously about is 1903. It's totally ignored to this day, and it's one of the most fundamental things in the entire literature. Many things are sitting on the shelf, parked in our scientific literature, never examined, never followed up, not in our present models. Some of them force revisions of many of our most fundamental thoughts. Next slide. Here is an example, for example, it goes all the way back to the 1800s, of, a, of something that laid fallow for 40-something years. People just didn't have a kinetic theory of gases and so forth spring full tilt and with sweet reason accept it. That's not what happened. Forty something years went by till the old guys who opposed it died. That's how you got that kind of physics. Many of the things you studied in your books in university, Wegener who discovered uh, the plates in the earth and the movements of the plates. The name Wegener was made the name the same word as fool, utter fool. People would say, oh, he's a Wegener, which means he's an utter fool. Anybody ever apologize to Wegener? Hell no, like the Cajun says. <laughs> Next slide, please. And today, it's worse than ever. If you are a young fellow going to college, going to university, and you are curious, you know, scientists are supposed to be curious. Don't be too curious. Unless you pay the freight and learn the subject the way it's taught to you and learn to apply it, you're not going to live and do well, and you're not going to get your doctorate. And neither is the professor who's teaching you and allowing you to do that. He's in a continuous game of putting in requests for money, proposals. Maybe one in 80 gets. If he can't fund his graduate students or he can't fund his own research and if he can't get his papers published in the literature, he's dead. He may as well go work in a butcher shop. And many of them do. So we have a, a thing in science where when we use a phrase like the standard model, we mean a little more than just people with sweet reason have come to this conclusion. They beat you on the head and take your job. You don't get tenure. You don't become a full professor. You don't get your papers published. Sorry, but that's the way it is. It's not so much a giant conspiracy as it is a dogma. But, you know, it's splitting hairs to go <laughs> to make the difference. The end effect is the same thing. First, let's talk about what happened to electrodynamics. Now, Tesla, next slide, please. Tesla calls the present electrodynamics we have the most inexplicable aberration of the scientific mind that had ever been recorded in all of history. That did not endear him to the very few scientists, about three dozen all there were in those days, electrodynamicists who were struggling to understand this stuff. But Tesla was right. He was not wrong. I wouldn't have said it that way. That's much too blunt. But he spoke the truth. And I hope to show you a few of the errors that we've just propagated and nobody ever went back and changed. Next slide, please. Well, electric charge. First, we had a material ether. And then we didn't have a material ether. And the next thing was we didn't think we had an ether at all. So we had the ludicrous thing of a medium undergoing vibrations without a medium. A clothesline undergoing clothesline vibrations but without a clothesline. Now, that's what's in electrodynamics today. Electric charge. Nobody knows what it is. Over on the right, I show you a good physicist saying we really don't know what it is, but we know what it does. 
It's become very fashionable in physics to say we don't ask the question what anything is. We ask the question what it does. Our business is not to find out what anything is. And I'm saying, well, then, uh, then what are you doing? 